Um, I'm particularly pleased about this, this project because Julian has spoken before, and I guess we spoke maybe a year ago, and we were talking, and the growth that his organization has made, I think, has been tremendous, specifically when you think about they're focused on helping people that are uh, in the workforce today to build skills and to build competencies uh, to get a college degree. And so they've done a tremendous job, and I think um, Scott's going to share with you some of the successes that they've had in producing that. I mean, they were actually able, and I'm, I'm going to steal his thunder a little bit, but they're actually able, they just got their bachelor, one of their bachelor's degrees approved. It's the first bachelor's degree that you can get for $10,000. So $10,000 bachelor degree. So isn't that, that's super. I think that's phenomenal. So please join me in welcoming the stage, Julian and Scott. Excuse me. All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, I think that as speakers, Scott and I are exempt from the band role. Because we were sitting and talking like, well, do we have a favorite band? I've got like a long list of different genres and whatever, but I have to think about that one. Um, such a such a pleasure to such a pleasure to be here. It's it, we we really do want this to be a conversation, and we'd like to um, you know just sort of put out there initially some. Um, we're going to show a few slides and share share. I'm going to you know do a little bit of framing, um, but what we want to what we want to move in on as early as you'd like is a, a discussion. So feel free to jump in, interrupt us, and so on. Um, what, what, what we'd like to do here is, um, well, let me see, I think I have a little magic clicker. All right. Um, so, 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 so just want to get everyone on the same page with what, you know, you can expect to, to learn from us today. Uh, we, first we want to, you know, talk about, um, um, what competencies are and, and then how they translate to promotable skills. And, and, and we really want to offer, you know, we really, this is a case study. What, what College for America and our, our Orange Lake Resorts are doing is, is, um, is, is, we believe, a model that we hope others will consider. I want to begin by talking about data. And I think what, what for me, what really is exciting about this is, um, so I ran a consulting think tank for 15 years, and just a year ago, merged it in with Southern New Hampshire University to, to help start this new college for America, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, my work over the years has always been focused on on how do we get employers and educators on the same page? And I believe, I think Scott shares my belief that that a competency-based approach allows us to use workforce analytics on the education side, believe it or not, the way so many of you do now routinely in the world of business. So what we're really trying to model is a, a, a new way of, of educating and to, to serve both individual students' workers and workers' needs as well as company needs. Um, and you know, the, so, so just beginning with kind of some of the big data, the unfilled jobs out there are definitely taking their toll. And you can see here on the screen, um, where did this come from again? Career, oh, Career Builder Survey, that's right. EMSI Career Builders, it's here. 54% um, 50, of employers have open positions they can't fill. It's costing companies an average of $14,000 for every job that stays vacant for three months or longer. And if you drill down, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Um, and employers are concerned about the, you know, the cost of dealing with backfill positions. Um, and, and then we have all these gaps that are really making this difficult. So we talk, I, I do a little blogging from time to time, uh, and I've written a bit about the, the skills gap, and you know, we hear about this again and again, and, 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 and so much of this is, um, is predicated on the, the notion that now 65% of jobs um, require some post-secondary education. Um, that's a pr projection from Georgetown University. Um, so there's this, there's this, you know, it used to be that high school diploma or GED was an entry to a career. That's no longer the case. I mean, in the most basic jobs, from, for the most part, all require at least some post-secondary. Um, and, and so, you know, so how are we doing to address this issue? Well, a couple surveys recently by Gallup for two different organizations found like amazingly different uh, results. One talked to higher ed leaders, um, chief academic officers, who, who, who said that 96%, 96 percent of whom said that they believe that their institutions are appropriately preparing graduates for work, while at the same time, 14% of the general population, but only 11% of business leaders agree. 
So it's like, you know, whose issue is this? Whose problem is it? Is it business? Is it education? Um, I like to believe it's sort of both. We did a survey um, at College for America this past year of four or 500 um, business executives and found that um, companies these days, and, we're seeing, and this is echoed in other research I've seen, companies are preferred to, um, um, to, to develop management, uh, management uh, personnel, you know, move people up the pipeline from within their companies, um, but they lack that, uh, um, um, uh, that, that these folks, they, they report that these folks lack promotable skills. And we keep hearing that again and again and again. So today's options definitely fall short. Um, the traditional colleges just were not built for working adults. So many of the students, so College for America is, is really specifically targeted to working adults. And what we're finding is that for so many people, especially people who lack the post-secondary credentials they need to advance, you know, it just, it just doesn't work for them. In the first case, maybe they couldn't afford to go to school. Being in school means having to be in, you know, whether it's online or even bricks and mortar, oftentimes having to be, you know, following a certain course at a certain amount of time dictated by the school, not by your own time. Um, projects, you know, at school, you know, curriculum may not have any clear relevance to what you're doing in life, especially after you've been out of school for a while and you're working. And, um, and then what does, and then for employers, it's like, well, so what does, you know, what is the B plus that, or sorry, you're probably an A student. What does the A that Scott got in his section, um, you know, in his college mean compared to the B plus I got in mine? It's like, what, you know, what, really what relevance does that have? Um, Schedule is a huge issue. It's, it's when, you know, when it comes to trying to juggle school and, and, and work and family, work and family always seem to win for most people. And then cost is a huge factor. So competency-based approach <clears throat> is really a whole new way of thinking about this. And, and so, and I'm gonna talk, drill down a little bit more because that's really where our analytics come in and you'll get to see how, you know, kind of a little bit how we're trying to be smart about, smart about this. Um, but competencies are focused on, you know, skills that are articulated, definable, measurable. You can see them, you know, employers get them. You see them in job descriptions. Many companies now are using competencies in their own uh, personal management. Um, and um, and it's you know and, and competencies can define learning. So so in our program, you know you you um, you 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 you, um, you know you you master your hundred. 20 competencies, say, and you have your associate's degree, whether it takes you six months or two years. Um, and then competencies, a competency-based approach is, does, not, does not tie us to seat time. So you do not have to be in that course for those hours, whether you know the material or not. So, um, and competency, a competency-based approach, so just to talk a little bit about how we do this, um, what, what we'll do is go out and my, my team, our, my job at the college is, is to ensure that our offerings have labor market relevance. And so what we'll do is um, industry analysis, industry trend analysis, occupational trend analysis, and we'll look very precisely at the competencies that are in demand in the jobs for which our college is preparing students. And then we'll use that information um, and feed it to our faculty who work with subject matter experts to develop the projects that form the basis of our curriculum. And so the kinds of competencies we're talking about are, you know, like negotiating with others to resolve conflicts and settle disputes or being able to convey information by creating charts and graphs. Very, very practical. Same stuff that our students in the traditional programs need to know, but you know, designed in a way for working adults. Um, we, just as an example, we did a report uh, just this past year, and actually one last week we released on insurance. The first was on healthcare, where we looked at competencies. So, you know, with the healthcare reform, there's all this responsibility being pushed to frontline workers. Um, and, you know, so many healthcare providers just kind of reeling with all of this, like, well, what, how, what do we make of it? How does it, um, how, how do we plan? How many, you know, custom, how many uh, um, patient care representatives do we need and medical assistance and so on? Well, we did some analysis of the six fastest growing healthcare jobs and found that um, um, there are about two, there are just over 200 competencies that cut across all of those frontline jobs, um, those six 
fastest growing jobs. And then 50, um, 200 cut, um, two, there were 200 total and about 50 that cut across every single one of them. So our healthcare curriculum is designed with those very specific competencies in mind. And what employers are finding is that they, can, they, it, they, they don't have to be so caught up in how many of these employees and those we need because we kind of get a sense of the competencies that cut across those positions. So College for America, just very briefly before I turn it over to Scott and he can talk a little bit about how this is actually playing out in a real life partnership with employers. So we're a nonprofit organization. We are part of Southern New Hampshire University, which is a private a nonprofit college based in Manchester, New Hampshire. We have um, three sort of business units. We, um, our traditional college, our <clears throat> sort of coming of age camp college uh, where we have our campus and um, you know, climbing wall and sushi bar and all the things you know students are interested in classes and professors with patches. You know, we um, we we have three thousand students on campus. Uh, we started in two thousand seven a um, an online college that has that has now grown to the third largest nonprofit online college. You may see it advertised around the country um, quite frequently. Um, and then College for America was started uh, this past year really as, as, as a disruptive innovation um, with the idea that there's something like 43 million people in this country who are working who lack post-secondary credentials, period. There's many more who are working who are under-credentialed, who may need that BA but don't have it. Um, we were st started really specifically to address those populations. Um, and, and so all our projects are, are so, so, so students um, um, complete projects, embedded in these projects are these competencies that I've talked about. And then upon successful mastery of projects, um, students attain their degree. Again, whether it takes them um, six months or, 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 or three years. We, we actually already have um, um, several graduates. We, uh, uh, we, we're, um, we have, uh, I think it's, it's over 60 now, business partners uh, that we're working with. We just went live in October, um, uh, in, you know, in, in, in including um, Holiday Inn uh, Beach Resorts and, uh, and many others. Um, we, we've had um, over 800 students now involved in the program. We have uh, um, uh, about, I think it's about a, a dozen, 15 graduates. Um, and several, about half of whom ha completed their associates, their fully accredited associates degree. That was our first offering in six months, which, um, which is kind of, un you know, kind of unheard of. Um, a half have also been promoted in their positions. So it's really achieving that kind of dual purpose for us of advancing education and, and career. Um, and it's for 20, it's all costing $2,500 a year, all you can learn. So the $10,000 BA, when it was approved a couple weeks ago by NIASC, which is the Northeast um, accreditor for higher education, um, and we, I actually called an editor at, uh, I know at Bloomberg Business Week and kind of told them about our story, and within days, this was like all over the news, it was a crazy, crazy big story. Um, last week, like a couple days after the, the, the story first appeared, one day we had over 80,000 distinct visitors to our website. Um, it's just crazy. So we're definitely hitting a nerve. And, um, and, I, and I think, you know, what I want to do is just turn it over to you, to you, Scott, to talk about how this is playing out with Holiday and Cold Vacations. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. So about a year and a half ago, uh, my president and CEO came in and said, we have a new vision. And our new vision is uh, we are going to be a billion dollar company in 10 years. And at that point, we were about a $250 million organization. So in 10 years, he wants to grow us to be a billion. So right now, uh, we currently have about 12 resorts in our portfolio across the country, and we're going to be adding two to three new resorts every year uh, between now and we reach that billion dollar goal. So a pretty aggressive goal. Uh, but with that, for the first time ever, development became not just a nice to have, it became uh, one of the key strategies to getting us to that billion dollars. So where in the past, and I don't know about you in your world, uh, but training and development, it's nice to have, we know we need it, but when push comes to shove, we don't get the dollars, we don't get the priority. Uh, but now we have it, so I'm excited. Uh, for the first time that we are now uh, getting the resources that we need to put together a really solid training and development program for our employees. So the first thing I was tasked with was to go out and assess the needs uh, because all of the executives agreed 
that talent was going to be the number one thing that would stop us uh, from getting from where we are today to getting to that billion dollar uh, goal. So first thing I had to do was go out and reassess the competencies that we had prescribed for all of the roles throughout the organization. We wanted to make sure that we understood what are the skills that are needed to be successful in every role throughout the organization. So as I'm looking to grow leaders and I have a front desk manager who wants to become a general manager one day, I know what the recipe is to being a great general manager within our company and then I can work with that front desk manager uh, developing his skills and competencies and help him get there. Um, so that was step one. Uh, step two is I had to do a talent review. So I, I went out and we assessed all of our uh, key leaders throughout the organization. And we looked at 192 of our most senior leaders. These were senior managers, directors, and above uh, throughout the entire company. And one of the very first kind of big aha moments for me was that over 50, we well, had 56 of those leaders with no post-secondary degree. They had not gone to college. 56 of our 192 or so senior leaders uh, did not have a college degree listed. We also were able to identify, again, what were those, uh, we were able to kind of assess, okay, we've got a list of individuals that want to continue to grow with us. We, we now know what they want to do when they grow up. We also understand what their competencies, uh, we could assess their competencies today and identify where those gaps are for development. Another piece of data that we looked at uh, was our employee engagement survey uh, results that we do every year. And for four years in a row, uh, development came up as the number one uh, thing that our employees wanted more of. And uh, so we had employees in our team uh, members saying we want development and we could tell through our talent assessment that they need development. So it was a win-win. It, it was a great um, uh, a match. So with that, we were, uh, I went out and I remember about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I was in Dallas at the ASTD uh, convention. Was anybody there in Dallas? About a year ago? No? Okay. Uh, anyway, it's a big convention. And I remember uh, going up and down the aisles in the Expo Center. And I said, I've got to find some resources. Because I've just opened up this Academy of Learning and Development for our organization. And I've got some internal courses that will help. Uh, but it's certainly nowhere near the amount of resources and tools that I need to help develop these folks uh, in their roles today. And I was really looking to create a nice blended approach to learning and development. And so as I'm walking up and down this huge expo, um, part of my strategy was to identify some uh, educational learning partners, some universities that I could partner with, uh, knowing that it was a need and it was a desire from our employees. And I remember going to the College for America booth, and it was the one booth that stood out from all the other booths. Uh, because what they have is so innovative and so different and so applicable to the needs that our company had, at least, uh, as far as competency-based learning. So we signed, the, we signed the partnership, and then we said, okay, we want to start a pilot group. So we identified, we looked at the list of 50 or so senior leaders with no college degree in our organization, and we set a couple criteria. We said, okay, of you 50 uh, leaders with no college degree, how many of you want a college degree? How many of you, is that part of your bucket list? And we had over 40 that said, yes, it's been something I've been meaning to do. I'll get to it someday. Um, but as Julian said earlier, life gets in the way. You got the family, you got work. It's so hard to fit that in. Uh, plus, it's financially hard to, uh, to accomplish that. So he said, OK, of you 40, uh, how many of you are uh, interested in still growing with us as an organization? And we kind of pared it down a little bit more because we had some of those leaders that were you know, ready for retirement and this was kind of their last role and they weren't interested in uh, any further development for, for, from us. And then we were also looking for folks that were interested in relocating. Because as we grow and we open up resorts from coast to coast, I'm looking for leaders that can kind of bring our culture with them to a new resort. And because uh, that's, that's, that's the hardest part is to have that culture inculcated in, into a new location. So with that, we found this pilot group, and we found uh, we picked 10 of our top leaders, and we enrolled them last March in College for America. And I will tell you that uh, 
it's 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 been an, an amazing experience. One of the one of the big differences is I, as the uh, the head of learning and development, I can track their progress. I can log in and see where each of them are on their journey. I can see what competencies they've mastered. Um, I can see how many are engaged versus uh, maybe they're struggling a little bit. So that helps me step in and say, you know, help remove some barriers maybe that exist in them getting the learning accomplished. So I wanted to share a couple of testimonials with you uh, because we have a couple of leaders that are in the program today. Both, uh, the, the two I'm gonna share with you uh, this morning are young leaders. They are both general managers of two of our smaller resorts in our portfolio. Uh, but both are gentlemen that I have worked with for years in developing. And they both kind of started off in the front desk and worked their way up. And again, they've got the right attitude. They've got the, they, they live and breathe our values. They understand our culture. It's a good fit. They're just lacking some of those basic skills that leaders need uh, in order to continue to progress uh, with us. So Christopher Perez is one of our general managers, and I'll tell you about Christopher. He is um, he's a single guy. He is up in our Panama City Beach Resort. Uh, but part of his development plan, in addition to going to College for America, uh, is that we've been sending him around to different resorts to learn from some of our senior general managers um, and giving him these short-term projects to work on. So he's on the road a lot. And Chris is uh, he is right on track with the program. He will, be, he will have his degree in two years or less. Uh, but one of the things that he said that he loves about this program is that when he does travel, he can't really log in and, and do the projects um, as much as he'd like. Um, and this program allows him to have that flexibility. So he may, he may work two hours one week or no hours one week when he's traveling. On, on, his, on his program, uh, but when he gets back into town, he could spend 10 hours. Uh, it's not like a traditional college program where you have to be you know, at class or you have to have certain projects by certain due dates. Uh, this program allows Christopher to, to travel, continue his development, and be successful uh, in attaining his college degree. The other gentleman is Pete Salas, who is at our Marco Island uh, property, and Pete is a, a father of two very small young ones. Uh, he is a single dad running a resort, balancing daycare and work. And again, college was on his bucket list, but I think it was on his, in 20, 30 years from now, I will go back and get that college degree. Uh, what College for America has been able to do is afford him that opportunity to, again, at night the kids are asleep, he can log in and work on the projects. And he's actually, on pace to complete the program in less than a year because he's just knocking it out at night. He is so pumped up and excited about this program. And so I think about someone like Pete, single dad, and you know, he's a, a, a general manager at a small property, so he's probably making 60000 a year um, with the two kids, and he's able to afford to go back to college because it only costs him $2,500 a year. Now the beautiful thing is what I would encourage you to think about is one of the things that we incorporated as part of the strategy was a tuition reimbursement program for the first time with our company. Uh, we launched it at the exact same time as we launched uh, College for America. And because again, it was one of those things that our employees have been asking for for years and years and years. And it's also something that m most of the, uh, the brands that we compete with have some sort of tuition reimbursement program. Um, so I was able to get $2,000 a year established for, which didn't seem like a lot to me, but I was happy to get something for our employees to utilize to go back to school. And I'll tell you, you take that $2,000 from the 2,500, and I'm not a mathematician, but I'm thinking that's like 500 bucks, right? A year to get a college degree. And the other beautiful thing is, uh, one of the things that differentiates College from America from our other learning partners is they direct bill us, and then we, you know, we pay them we bill out the departments uh, for the for the two thousand dollars for the tuition re, uh, reimbursement, and then we're able to set up uh, payroll deductions for the employees. And um, so, I'd initially set up fifty dollars a week for ten weeks, and thought, well, that'll be doable, right? I had one young lady in Vermont, uh, one of our front desk managers in Vermont, um, who tried to pull out of the program. And she'd been identified as an up-and-coming star and someone that we wanted to develop and get ready for that next step in their career, in her career. 
And she tried to pull out. When I asked her why she was pulling out of the program, she said, I, I can't afford $50 a week. And I hadn't thought, I didn't think like, oh my gosh, for some people, $50 a week, that's a lot of money, right? So again, one of the pieces of advice that I give uh, to you all, if you, if you do uh, have a program or sign up for College for America is be flexible. I was able to do uh, 20 week, $25 for 20 weeks. I even told her, if you want to do $10 a week for 50 weeks, I'll do that just to get you into that program. Um, so again, it's affordable for our employees. Um, now that the pilot program is done, we're now opening this up to all of our employees across the company. And I'm so excited, I'm very excited to hear that there's a bachelor's program now uh, that we'll also be able to, to offer out uh, to, our, to our members. But again, part of our key strategy is to send our workforce back to school, get them the skills, because I'm only one person and I can, as much as I offer workshops and things like that back at my um, headquarters, uh, I can only do this much. And uh, College for America is a great tool in our toolbox that we're able to, uh, to give to our, to our team members. Great. Thanks, Scott. You know, I, I, I just want to say, so what, so what Scott's describing, so, so we are, what Scott's describing, we're doing with another 60 co company partners. We're, we're a business to business model. We're not, College for America is not open. It's not, we're not on retail. So, so even though we've been flooded with thousands and thousands of calls from individuals who want this, we're, we believe that um, the model makes a lot of sense, particularly because of this workforce focus, for us to be partnering with employers to help them sort of solve and address specific problems, really largely around leadership and talent development, retention, um, succession planning, and so on. Um, and, and just a little bit more about the model, because neither of us mentioned this. The, um, so we don't really, we, we've sort of um, uh, um, broke disaggregated in the sense the traditional role. We don't have faculty in, in a sense. We have coaches who work with students who come from College for America. So when we partner with the company, you know, each student is assigned a coach, a learning coach. And the learning coach is their, their job, like the student cannot proceed in the program without first connecting with their coach and really figuring out how are they going to work this program into their busy lives? How are they going to set pace and how are they going to, you know, are they going to do plan to do their homework, I don't know, at night after the kids go to sleep on the weekends when they have a babysitter during, during work, no, just kidding. Um, um, hopefully not. Um, we allow some. I yeah, mean, well, maybe so, exactly. Sense. Well, yeah, no, actually, truth is, it varies from employer yeah. to employer. And, 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 and then the coaches also are, will in turn work, and it varies from company to company, but um, companies will have their own internal uh, HR training and development, you know, people, coaches, types, and so we'll coordinate with all of that. The whole idea is that we almost, we kind of come as a platform that's somewhat malleable, but the, the net result is that you're getting an accredited, you know, credible, um, um, rigorous college degree. Um, uh, yeah, which I think is also important. And then, and then when students complete projects, the other piece that we're really proud of that goes right back to the analytics, and we'd be happy to show this to any of you um, in greater detail. My, my, my um, colleague Steve Giglio and, and Kale Allen are, are you guys in here somewhere? Oh, there they are. There's Kale, Steve's, at the, I guess, at the back as well. Uh, well. Oh, there you are over there. We have a, a table outside, but we're happy to show you our learning management system, which we're really proud of, because in so many ways, what we're really talking about is a big data project. Everything the students do um, is captured in our learning management system, and we, we actually developed our own. It's, it's based on a Salesforce platform, because we found that in higher ed, there's just nothing to do a project-based approach. And so all the conversations and interaction with the coaches, all the project work, it all feeds into the system. And when students hit send or whatever they do, I mean, enter to send us a, 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 their, a project, because it is all online, um, their work goes to a reviewer who, who, will, who, who um, will get back to them within two days, 48 hours, although I think we're averaging 30 or so, um, with a review of that project and will we'll, we'll identify the competencies in that project that the student has mastered or not yet. So we're not grading them here. It's all about mastery and it's all about helping people, um, you know, especially people who've been out of school, don't see themselves necessarily as college material or something, you know, realizing they can fit this into their lives. It's all designed around this idea of kind of building confidence, building mastery. Um, and, the, and the reviewer gets back to the student with a review of that work and um, suggestions if they haven't mastered or not, if they're not yet, as to resources they might consider as they go forward. Um, and all of that feeds into the system. So the student has a portfolio that they can bring back to work to others. Um, we, in our bachelor's program, each student has to complete a 
capstone project that is a work-related project, so they're explicitly solving a work problem, although what we're finding, we're getting all these great stories. I don't know if you've heard any of these yet, Scott, from students who are saying, like, you know, they, they did some project that involves spreadsheets or whatever in our program. They've actually taken that methodology and used it on a work project. They're very proud of that. Um, and then all of this can feed back to our company partners, so they have those analytics. So it's, you know, it's just a very different approach to higher ed. Anyway, we'll, we're, um, we're doing a lot of the talking there, and we did say we wanted this to be interactive, so I see a hand, please. Come out, come on, bring it on. <laughs> what university are you associated with? Southern New Hampshire University is, is our. How does this person learn the competencies? Well, the, 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 the students learn the competencies from the projects. So for each, the, 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 all the, co the coach is really more like a career life planning, uh, co slash college advisor, they're not, they're really not uh, a content expert. The student, the, the students undertake projects. There are, um, um, the, 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 there, there, there are sort of 20 different um, buckets in, in which we have uh, these various projects embedded. The projects, for each project, and this we can show you with the learning management system, there is a rubric that says here's what the project is about, here are the competencies that are embedded in this project, here are the steps to doing this project, and here's what you're going to be measured on, um, as well as, did I say, resources associated with the project. There are no books, there are, everything is online. Our, our quote, faculty and subject matter experts put together these projects, and they are essentially curating material from online as well as some that we develop. So the, it's all online. So the, it's all self-directed. So the students, um, so, we'll, so what we'll find is for, so, so say you're, I don't know, really strong communicator, you know that, and you're, and you're, and you're really good with, I don't know, spreadsheets. Um, there are projects where you're going to be able to, if you want right away, and this is something you'd work through with your coach, just take on those projects right away that you know you're really, really, you know, where you have a lot of experience and you can just sort of nail these projects. And that's often what the students who are really sprinting through the program are doing. They know this stuff. They've been doing it on the job for years. Our average students so far, this is early returns, but our average student so far is like early 40s. Um, they're, um, and, and they're, you know, these are people who've been out there, but for one reason or another, life intervened, and they never, they never got those degrees that they need. Questions, comments? Oh, come on, don't be shy. I say the model is really nice because the coach has been a key part of this for our students because the coach stays in contact with them uh, on a weekly basis and has calls or emails. They set up um, times to kind of meet and advise our students. But I'd say this model is, I, I kind of compare it to, you know, you have your college class that we all sat through, a lot of us sat through, you know, that kind of lecture and you take notes and you memorize and then you forget it, right? Versus like learning how to ride a bike or learning to drive a car. It, they're learning themselves. It's all, we're drawing, yeah. they're drawing that learning out from those participants, but it's, I mean, they're gonna retain this information. Yeah. So um, I'm supposed to model behavior. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Yvette Montero Sabatico. Oh, uh, that's right. I am a, a partner at Kedge and at, formerly was with the Walt Disney Company. I wish I had a favorite band, um, but I have small children, so it would be like the Wiggles or something lame like that. I also have a 17-year-old, so it could be uh, a teen band, but I have no life. So, so don't model that behavior, but if you could introduce yourself before you ask a question, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so my question is this, I know it's early on, but I'm, I'm convinced that you've already talked about retention and what this will do to your retention, because I imagine it has to be a big player here, oh, yeah. that if you are investing in this way into your um, employees in such an intimate way, because it's not just, you know, Disney has tuition reimbursement. You go, you pick your school, you go through a form process, you never talk to anyone, you fill it out, the money comes, hopefully. This sounds like it's much more involved from an employer standpoint. So have you talked about or think about, you know, what do you think about the retention play is on this project? Well, we're, we're hoping it's gonna be a huge part in retaining, especially the people that we want to retain, right? So we are, the nice thing about this program is we are selecting who gets to participate, and it's those folks that we know are those, that kind of that future talent, people we don't want to escape us and go to Disney, yeah. uh, one of our competitors, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, absolutely, 
and uh, so retention is one of our one of our goals, and we'll be measuring that as we go. Because again, we just started in March. Yeah. Well, and and, it, and interesting for us. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we presented at the big ASTD conference in DC this time with folks from one of our partner organizations, Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield. And they started the program initially for customer service folks. And it just was so interesting. We, um, um, I did a pre presentation with their uh, you know, head of training and president of my college did a presentation with their president. Um, and both of them talked all about the cultural aspects and how, like, so they started with these, these frontline customer service people, but then a whole bunch of managers asked, more like the groups you're targeting, managers who lack those credentials or people on their way to management. And, you know, it's for them, someone in the audience asked them, like, well, yeah, but what if, like, we train someone and they leave, you know, to go, I don't know, to another insurer? They're like, you know what, the benefits we're getting out of, like, kind of the goodwill are keeping these people and others who are now like, hey, we want to line up for this. So it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, I don't want to sound like I'm selling, but, you know, like we spend, you know, I go to weekend conferences for, I don't know what this costs, I can't remember, but, you know, it's what it's going to cost for a year of college. It's kind of incredible that, that to be able to have that tool now to build, to add to the arsenal. And we're also going to use it to attract talent, hopefully, too. Right. right? So we built this into our recruiting materials and as an opportunity, we really commitment to education. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Hi. Michelle Stanford, and I'm with McGraw Hill Education. And bands. Well, so when you first asked that, I thought, okay, I, I know of a singer, not necessarily a band, that I grew up with. And I thought, well, but do I really want to share that? Because that's going to really date me if my looks don't. So then I thought, all right, well, is there another band? And <laughs> So, so I'm going to give you two. One is not a band, and the first one is my all-time favorite is Neil Young. Uh -huh, so I grew up with one. Neil Young. I love and adore him, and his music is wonderful. So my second band of the more current is uh, uh, donated to me by my son, uh, or introduced to me by my, by my son. And I don't know uh, them well enough other than I really appreciate their instrumentals and I think that I think so I'm telling you here This is you know, dated. Uh, I think they're out of Japan and they're named um, Gabriela and Rodrigo or it might be the other way around anyway. They are uh, amazing in their instrumentals. So those are my my two bands. So my question for you is uh, It McGraw Hill education. We're aggressively hiring up, uh, attracting uh, technology talent. Uh, folks who have uh, degrees or higher learning in software engineering, uh, technology architecture, those kinds of things, because it's critical to how we develop and release our products and our services. So how does your, your program uh, in, in any of them, because I know that a number of institutions are going to this competency-based mm -hmm. curriculum. How, are, how does that, what you're offering, uh, parallel or complement some of those more core disciplines? Because, yeah. and before I let, I let you answer that, one of the things that we're seeing is that on one hand, there's a, a very strong reliance on that expertise. On the other hand, it's transferring that expertise, whether it's, it's collaboration or it's, it's influencing skills, those competency-based behaviors that are necessary to kind of balance out both. Yeah, that's no, a great, it's a great question. We, I, I sort of see this as like, I don't know, um, Kind of like the T, you know. So, so um, we're we're a liberal arts I institution. We're addressing our degrees are um, our, our associates is a general education degree with a concentration in business. Our bachelors now are in communications and business management. Um, we're really addressing the the broader skills to make sure that people can read, write, think critically, have digital and fluency and literacy, can work in teams, can solve problems, are ethical, and can apply this in the workplace. We're not really going at the technical side, kind of. So, so, but, but. But number one, the approach absolutely could be applied there. But that's just not what we're doing at this point. We're really sticking kind of to the non-technical piece. Oftentimes, that is being um, dovetailed with more technical training, very often done by our employer partners who want to train in their ways. Um, um, and, and yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really what it's about for us. The competencies, part of what we're looking at, and the reason we're so fixed on this whole competency approach is part of the problem with very technical training we found is, you know, like, like if you, you know, we're using semantic analytics that allow us to look at the competencies and 
because thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs, and then to see how they might align with our curriculum. The competencies, the level at which we're looking at competencies, um, these competencies have a long shelf life across our careers. You know, the kind of stuff I flashed before, you know, being able to work with spreadsheets or something. This is something you can do whether you're an expert in today's version of Java or one that was out five months ago or two years ago. So, so we're really focusing on building those skills that have kind of a long shelf life and to carry people in, you know, forward in their careers. And I'll just add that we have one of our students is a director of IT in our organization. Um, and what's great is he's very technically sound. He knows all the technology platforms. And, uh, but what he was missing was some of these basic leadership right. skills and communication skills, collaboration. And one of the nice things is these projects that they work on, some of them are individual projects, but a lot of them require them to work in teams uh, virtually. Yeah. And so just that alone is worth the $2,500 to build that, those collaboration skills. And We're a tool in the toolbox. Yeah. I guess what I keep coming back to. Did I see another? Hi. I'm Renee Jones with Mayo Clinic, and uh, two favorite bands. It took me a while to narrow it down. Um, one might date me a little bit, Foo Fighters. Huh? And uh, the other is Mumford & Sons. Can't get enough oh, of that. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, my question is about, um, for Scott, about how down the line you intend to measure whether or not this, this program was successful. Do you have metrics in mind, to, you know, three, five years down the road to look at where these people are in their careers, the skill, how they've you know, contributed the skills to the workplace. Yeah, so there, it's, we are gonna be tracking through, uh, through a number of different sources, but um, one of the things is our, part of our succession planning, all these individuals that we're enrolling are part of our succession planning uh, program, so we're hoping that these individuals, you know, College for America is one of the several things that we've identified for their development, and so we're looking at uh, you know, the progression in their career. So uh, five years down the, the road, ideally, these individuals will be higher up and helping us lead at a different level to the organization. You know, and part of, um, I'm glad you asked that question, because part of what is really um, exciting for me to be at this conference is um, we want to really, on our end, you know, we, we want to keep drawing on that data that the employers see as valuable to really figure out how are we, you know, how are we driving ROI in this. And so really open to and interested in hearing thoughts about, you know, what's the kind of data we should be looking at and how can we link up with you around all of this? Because we want to, because part of what you know, we're charged with is, is, is both looking at that hard data and figuring out what are the, you know, the anecdotal stories are coming and you can hear lots of them from Steve and Kale and, and Scott and me, but um, you know, really beginning to get some good hard numbers because that's another thing that in education, it just lacks, you know, it's all very fuzzy wuzzy out there. And the other nice thing about uh, College for America is I, I, again, I have access to all of this data, which I don't have from any other university. I mean, other universities, I don't even know who's enrolled, because I'm not allowed to know, right? So we know through tuition reimbursement who's taking what classes, but at the end of the day, I've got a great pulse on what's going on yeah. with these 10 individuals. Well, and we do, I should say with the data, I mean, we're bound by the same rules as everyone else in terms of FERP, is it? Um, we, and so we, stu our students, we will ask students waiver, yeah. to sign a waiver. And most of the, so far they've all, I don't think anyone has refused to do that. I think they're all fine yeah. with that. So, um, but even if they don't do that, we can still share data in the aggregate. Okay, we have time for one last question. One last question. Anywhere? No? Okay, Julian Scott, thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Thanks.